It looks like it's suddenly silent, which means we have to get started. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Niemeyer. I'm the uh, Craigslist Chair for New Media and the Director of the Center for New Media at UC Berkeley. And I'm a professor in art practice. Today, I'm going to uh, not speak about anything except introduce a fabulous panel that's going to speak about computational aesthetics. But in uh, introducing them, I hope that my slides will become a little bit more clear as we go along. They're a little blurry right now. And um, <laughs> I um, want to point out that computational aesthetics for me has to do with uh, algorithms fundamentally. Um, and uh, algorithms are uh, a, a device that links a system to a set of data. And algorithms, informally speaking or intuitively speaking, carry us from a problem to a solution in multiple steps. So we're required to iterate through a number of data in order to arrive at a solution. And um, so the system of the algorithm and the element of the data are in an aesthetic relationship to each other because um, the data form a part and the system forms a whole and the data is a part of a whole and the relationship between the part and the whole is what to me is uh, the definition of aesthetics. So we look at computational aesthetics, um, we look at uh, uh, projects that artists make, but also uh, much more broadly projects we encounter every day. So for example, uh, um, a visiting artist who's gonna come join us soon, Jose Carlos Martinot, did a very interesting art project where the, uh, the Secret Service of Peru um, was overthrown and the and data that they had collected became uh, no longer a secret, but rather became public. Now, how to make that thing public, how to make aesthetics around making something public, his solution was to attach little receipt printers to each window of the building that used to house the Secret Service and to print uh, the secrets out on receipts. And the receipts would fly through the streets and blow in the wind. And thereby he created an algorithm where the data was from entering, uh, exiting a structured order and entering a chaotic order. So he made noise out of, out of signal. And that is a very beautiful transition. But most of the time when we do computing aesthetics, uh, and we, when we compute things, we go from a state of chaos to a state of order. In other words, we produce negative entropy. Producing negative entropy produce, uh, takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of energy. That kind of energy is, is labor that um, really is at the core of life. And so if I think about uh, aesthetics, I think about um, Henri, Henri Laborit's book, uh, Biologie et Structure, in which he describes the cell as a fundamental image of aesthetics, because the cell has a number of parts that work together. And because they produce negative entropy, they produce a higher order, and that higher order essentially is life. So computational aesthetics is a, a mirror of life. Now, that, um, that, that can take us in many different directions. It can take us to very beautiful things out of art, such as, for example, NOAA, the, um, NOAA, the our state um, agency for, um, for uh, oceans, and uh, they uh, collect data about uh, seawater levels all around the world. They don't stop at the borders of the U.S. because the ocean doesn't stop at the borders of the U.S. either. And uh, it continues around the world. And so they collect data about seawater levels all around the world and they take it upon them to render that data uh, to the public in an aesthetic fashion. And translating that, making it accessible, is creating out of the chaos of seawater levels that we don't know about an ordered experience, negative entropy that allows us to gain insight about things like climate change, which are absolutely vital to our survival. In a way, those kinds of data make us, our collective creature, less blind. And the collective creature of humanity, you could think of as a blind creature that sort of um, rummages around on the whole planet and eats everything inside, like a weed. But um, I don't think uh, it's good for that creature to be entirely blind. And so the more sensory organs we have, and the more we can make sense of the data we get, the less blind we are. Maybe as a creature, as a collective creature, we will gain some insights that will ensure our uh, better relationship between us and our hosts and our environment. So that's a very hopeful use of aesthetics, right? Aesthetics carry forward towards insight. But aesthetics also can carry us into the dark corners of insight where we, where we don't feed uh, the, the feelings of hope, but rather the feelings of uh, control and fear and those kinds of things. And so uh, another outcome of uh, computational aesthetics, of course, is uh, Uber and what Uber does with your rideshare data, with your ride data. And so, so recently the executives of Uber were very proud that they could figure out that um, who sleeps with whom based on late night and early morning cab rides. 
And so they run a simple algorithm that says, you know, who took a cab before midnight and who took a cab before 10 a.m. And, and any time those two cabs go in the same place, they, there's a pretty good guess that these people spent the night together. And, uh, and they think this is really funny. Of course, this is a fundamental violation of privacy, and it produces insights that are essentially undermining the dignity of the user of the application. And, uh, and maybe even the dignity, the very, the very human dignity of, of anybody who, who is uh, described in this data. So you can see that this field can go both ways. It can reveal ugly things, it can reveal beautiful things. And uh, as we progress here, we are revealing something very beautiful, which is our next panel that's coming up. <laughs> and uh, the first speaker is Ed Shankin, who did something really beautiful that inspired this introduction. He um, wrote the uh, chapter here on computing aesthetic, and he writes in it, as a relatively new set of interdisciplinary practices at the crossroads of computer science and art, the term it demarcates an emerging and unfixed field. And I, I'm thinking of Wittgenstein when I think of the beauty of the unfixed, of the blurry, and uh, I want to thank you, Ed, for, uh, for making that uh, comment there, that it wants to remain unfixed because uh, it's, it's constantly exploring at both boundaries where the algorithms are technical and where they're human, where, where they do good things, where they do bad things, but it's an uncertain field, and we want it to be uncertain so we can keep asking those questions. After Ed's presentation, which will be about 15 minutes, we will get a, uh, a treat and a presentation from Shannon Jackson, who, although the biography modestly doesn't state this, is still a professor at um, uh, UC Santa Cruz. And I remember her... Um, Sharon Daniel. Did I say something else? Okay, Shannon Jackson. Oh. <laughs> well, Shannon, sorry, where are you? <laughs> Sharon Daniel. Yes, he sits right here. And, and, um, well, there... <laughs> there, was another, there was another blurry moment there, so <laughs> what are the aesthetics of that? I've created entropy here instead of negative entropy. All right, so let's keep on with the negative entropy and clean things up. So Shannon Jackson, um, and Sharon Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm getting Sharon Daniel there. There we go. Sharon Daniel in 2004 did a fabulous project and many followed since, but I really want to thank Sharon for uh, doing this project uh, and inspiring me to, to think in those terms. In, in 2004, do you remember the f uh, flip cam? Who remembers the flip cam? It was a, a camera that was uh, cheap and actually um, Sharon Daniels' team uh, hacked the camera and gave it to uh, um, uh, uh, people, uh, residents of, of Villas in uh, uh, Buenos Aires to film what they did after collective sessions when they went home. And then that video material came back to the collective sessions which had a lot to do with dance. And so she used those cameras to allow the uh, participants to collect data about their homes and bring that data as if in an algorithm back to the collective and make it part of the collective vocabulary for dance. And that then became an element in uh, dance performances that traveled all around the world. It's a beautiful project and it shows how, how video is both data and material and research and uh, a way to collect um, information and uh, reuse it for other purposes. So she's going to be our third speaker, and uh, our second speaker, and Eric Paulos, who is also in the room. Eric, where are you? There you are, hi. Um, Eric Paulos is our, our third speaker, and he's going to speak about, um, he, uh, well, he, his, uh, he's going to speak about aesthetics from a point of view of a material practice. And the exciting thing about Eric is practicing at UC Berkeley right now, and he's at Citrus, and uh, he's co-founder of the Invention Lab, and also a member of the Berkeley Center for New Media. And the exciting thing to me about his practice is that he um, does a material discourse of aesthetic in investigation. So oftentimes, he actually builds devices that behave in a certain way, and the way they're built, and the way they uh, are in the world, the way we interact with them, those are all material aesthetics, and so there's a material discourse there that uh, takes us out of the theoretical space and into things we can touch and things that become very tangible. Um, I'd like to end my introduction and uh, uh, by pointing out that computationally, the first slide you saw is actually more effort than the last slide you saw, because I had to apply a Gaussian blur to it. And the Gaussian blur is a computational algorithm that says, <coughs> let's, let's take neighboring pixels and blend them with each other. And so the computer program has to go through each pixel of this image and figure out what the neighboring pixel is and average the value of one pixel with the other, thereby creating a kind of a unity or an aesthetic of, of, uh, of coherence that then maybe uh, is uh, giving way to uh, more specificity here, but then if we combine the two, we have the text itself and then the shadow behind it, which is the blur of the shadow. And that's something we do all the time in Photoshop. And uh, that's one of these computational aesthetics 
that have become a commonplace of faking material presence in an immaterial world. So, so now it looks like this text is a little bit floating on top of something, and uh, that, that is a trick we do. There's, full, there's lots of tricks here that have the shadows and the lighting effects that make us feel like we're in a material world, although we really are, um, aren't, or perhaps we are because all this information takes energy to put on the screen, and uh, all the information needed to go from a state of chaos to a state of order. <coughs> so, with that, I'd like to e introduce Ed Schenken, and we'll bring up his presentation. And um, uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Do you want to have everybody move on up? Do you want to have a whole panel? If you could have everyone who's on the panel ask to come up front too. Okay. Here you go. Thank you. It's off right now, so I'll turn it on when it's clipped. We'll check. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. So I can just put this in my pocket now. It's on. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Michael, for the invitation to be here and uh, to Lauren and Shannon, or should I say Sharon? <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> My talk is 16 minutes, so I hope I get through it on time. Aesthetic computing demarcates an emerging and unfixed field, as Greg would be saying, consisting of interdisciplinary practices at the crossroads of computer science, art, and philosophy. According to computer scientist Paul Fishwick, it concerns the application of the philosophical area of aesthetics to the field of computing. As philosopher Michael Kelly notes, this type of definition favors art and aesthetics applied to computing, not the other direction. Similarly, the annual computational aesthetics conferences since 2005 have focused on highly technical aspects of image production and analysis, and rarely reckon with the aesthetic concerns that characterize contemporary art practice since the 1960s. Artists and art historians that have contributed to aesthetic computing discourses have used a wide range of terms to signify similar ideas and practices in which the relationship between art and computing is more symmetrical if not weighted in favor of artistic concerns and outcomes. Ross Ashby's mid-century cybernetic theories of the computer as an intelligence amplifier influenced pioneers of computer art, including Roy Ascot, Michael Knoll, and Manfred Moore. Uh, Rias and McWilliams have reasserted that software is a tool for the mind that can extend the intellect the author's decision to explicitly use, if not appropriate, this term in their title suggests a desire among artists and designers today to expand the conception of the field in a way that demands greater symmetry between aesthetics and computing. Similarly, my goal is to send out alternative genealogies for the emerging, for the merging of computation with aesthetics. In 2013, Fishwick, who's perhaps the foremost champion of the field, authored the entry Aesthetic Computing in the Encyclopedia of Human-Computer Interaction. Fishwick hypothesizes that given the embodied nature of human cognition, we should realize this embodiment through novel human-computer interfaces for learning formal languages. Thus, he calls for new methods of interacting with highly abstract formal languages like Perl and Java in ways that parallel and exploit the inevitably embodied circumstances of human learning. <coughs> Applauded for its strengths and insights, Fishwick's encyclopedia entry also have been criticized. Scientist and Leonardo Journal editor Roger Molina points out that it insufficiently recognizes the substantial contributions that artists have made to um, elucidating major scientific issues. Kelly admires the emphasis on embodiment, but argues that the computer scientist definition is unnecessarily limited by its focus on pedagogy and cognition pertaining to formal languages. He suggests that 
if the whole point of aesthetic computing is to develop and sustain a richer conception of computing, then it must employ a more expansive conception of embodiment informed by recent discourses in aesthetics and other disciplines. Kelly notes art historian Caroline Jones's assertion that uh, the critique of technoculture must quote, take up these technologies in the service of aesthetics, which provides a site for questioning how we are interacting with technology today. In Fishwick's account, um, account of aesthetic computing, the role of artists is limited to serving particular pedagogical and cognitive roles already defined within the domain of computer science. By contrast, I would argue that artists, art, artists, and aesthetics fundamentally can alter the presuppositions and goals of computer science. In this regard, it is likely that artists and art theorists whose work explicitly questions the aesthetic, technological, and scientific conventions of their time are best suited to make such a radical impact. Let's look at a few historic examples that provide a basis for considering the potential contribution of artists and art theorists to aesthetic computing. Throughout history, many artists who take up technology in the service of aesthetics do so by creating working models of possible futures that exceed the current perceptual, epistemic, and ontological limits. These heterotopias enable people to experience in the present what may become widespread phenomena decades later. Those who interpret, mediate, and shape the discourses surrounding such practices also play an important role in this project by advancing the production and dissemination of aesthetic theories. For example, Jones observed in 2012 that Burnham's theories of systems aesthetics, esoteric in 1968, now seem tailor-made for the contemporary art world. As I've noted elsewhere, Burnham drew explicit parallels between experimental art practices and larger cultural and social transformations of the so-called information age. In particular, he noted that the tendency to abstract the concrete materiality of objects into ephemeral information characterizes related, economic, uh, uh, related technological, economic, and cultural co uh, con constructs, information processing, the shift from industry to post-industry, and the so-called dematerialization of art. These insights from the 1960s, I argue, are even more relevant today than they were some 50 years ago. Burnham's 1970 software exhibition functioned as a testing ground for audiences to interact with information systems and their devices and created a context in which the public can personally respond to programmatic situations structured by artists. Burnham's curatorial vision was premised on the idea of software as a metaphorical parallel to the aesthetic principles, concepts, and programs that underlie the formal embodiment of actual art objects, which in turn parallel hardware. Modernist aesthetic theories and artworks emphasize the material form of an object in which a message is transmitted by the artist and received by the viewer in a one-way channel. By contrast, Burnham advocated what he called post-formalist art practices, conceptual art, performance art, uh, art and technology, that emphasize the software aspect of aesthetic production and enable a two-way exchange of information. Based on his experience working with computers as an artist in residence at MIT, Burnham's uh, essay, uh, The Aesthetics of Intelligent Systems, anticipates aesthetic computing. It describes how a dialogue evolves between the participants, a computer program and the human subject, so that both move beyond their original state. With these ideas in mind, software juxtaposed unplugged works of conceptual art, electronic artworks, and technological inventions that were not intended as art. Let's look at another example of how experimental art offers a psychic dress rehearsal for the future, to return to Burns' term. Since 1980, Roy Ascot's theory and practice of telematic art, 
uh, anticipated the tropes of collaboration, social networking, virtuality, and participation that had become primary characteristics of contemporary art, well, since the 70s, but increasingly since the mid-90s and popular culture since the mid-2000s. In the context of his theory and practice of cybernetic art by the mid-60s, Ascot had already envisioned the emergence of art created interactively with computers and remote artistic interdisciplinary collaborations via telecommunications networks. I'm not going to read the slide, so read it fast. <laughs> Ascot's 1983 telematic artwork, La Plisse Sur du Texte, explored the potential of computer networking for the interactive, remote, collaborative creation of a work of art that challenged the conventional aesthetic categories of artist, artwork, and audience. Rifting, uh, sorry, riffing on Roland Barthes' 1973 Le Plaisir du Texte, The Pleasure of the Text, La Plissure du Texte, The Pleading of the Text, similarly emphasized the generative idea of perpetual interweaving, but in a way that contests conventional subject-object relationships even more profoundly, because the work is not the product of a single author, but is pleaded together through a process Ascot calls distributed authorship. For Ascot, moreover, there is no finished work, no final outcome per se. Rather, the work emerges through a collaborative, uh, creative process. In this respect, it provides a working model for experimenting with and experiencing potentially expanded forms of telematically enhanced collective consciousness. La Plisseur du Texte anticipates various aspects of participatory culture, elaborated there. Um, several decades later, the tendency to abstract the concrete materiality of objects into ephemeral information that Burnham, Ascot, and others identified in the 60s is reflected and amplified in recent phenomena that equally challenge conventional technological, economic, and cultural constructs. The point is that the implication of these widespread technocultural shifts were being explored within the domain of art and aesthetics many years before the extent of their impact was beginning to be realized on a larger social scale. Such insights arguably have the potential to catalyze innovation and invention in computer science, if not to spawn a hybrid field of aesthetic computing that exceeds the limits of its disciplines, its constituent disciplines. The practice of aesthetic computing defined by Fishwick may accomplish very valuable paradigmatic research, but is less likely to question those paradigms and explore new ones. Indeed, artists tend to be masters of perverting technological correctness. In other words, certain artists engaged with new media tools and techniques apply a critical aesthetic sensibility that systematically attempts to interrogate if not undermine the operational logic of those technologies, the profit motive of the companies that produce them, and the cultural logic of neoliberal politics that propels the e-economy. Lozano Hemmer's examples include the misemployment of barcode technology in Perry Hoberman's Barcode Hotel, which facilitates collaborative play with unruly 3D virtual objects, rather than the utilitarian supply chain tracking of consumer goods. Similarly, esoteric programming languages, ESOLANGs, are designed to experiment with weird ideas to be really hard to program, to be a joke, or to serve artistic purposes, rather than for practical use. Nick Montfort has noted that such obfuscated codes explore the play in programming, the free space that is available to programmers and that can be exploited to make the program signify on different levels and in unusual ways. To conclude, Sun Microsystems co-founder Bill Joy's 2000 confessional essay, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, amounted to well, a midlife crisis in which a captain of industry, computer industry, suddenly realized that his professional career had contributed to the possibility of knowledge-enabled mass destruction. He observed that failing to understand the consequences of our inventions 
while we are in the rapture of discovery and innovation, seems to be a common fault of scientists and technologists. Although Joy's epiphany was compared with Einstein's 1939 letter to President Roosevelt alerting him to the possibility of a nuclear bomb, art historian Christine Stiles observed that Joy's awakening is not heroic. It is symptomatic of the problem. An utter disregard for the insights and research of the arts and humanities. In 1968, when Joy was about 14 years old, Jack Burnham argued for the crucial importance of art as a means of survival in an overly uh, rationalized society. Like many, many intellectuals of his time, he feared that the cultural obsession with and faith in science and technology would lead to the demise of human civilization. He proposed that an increasing general systems consciousness might convince us that our desire to transcend ourselves through technology is merely a large-scale death wish, and that ultimately the outermost limits of, reason, of reasoning are not reachable by post-human technology, but fall eternally within the boundaries of life. Perhaps if Joy had read aesthetic theory as part of his graduate studies in computer science at UC Berkeley <laughs> in the late 1970s, he could have spent the first quarter century of his career creating and promoting forms of aesthetic computing that foreground the critical investigation of its, quote, ethical and social political impact rather than only its internal structure, to quote Kelly. He wasn't talking about joy. I'm using his quote to make a comment on joy. These considerations all lead to a definition of aesthetic computing that includes a spectrum of inter- and transdisciplinary research, ranging from art and or aesthetics serving primarily scientific ends to computer science serving primarily artistic and or aesthetic ends. But beyond the instrumentalization of one field to serve the goals of another, Perhaps the most fruitful contributions of aesthetic computing will result from more symmetrical relationships. Such circumstances could catalyze creative frictions and synergies among, uh, among differing theoretical discourses, research methods, and evaluative criteria, leading to the reconceptualization of the con constituent disciplines. Aesthetic computing so construed would exceed current practices of computer science, art, and aesthetics, opening up possibilities for hybrid forms of discovery, expression, and knowledge production. Thank you. Congratulations also for being exactly on time. I'm oh, going to take your microphone. Right? Okay. I can't keep the mic. No, you can't keep the mic. Okay. okay. So I'll give this to you now. Do you have somewhere to attach it? This can go to the boot. <laughs> yeah. Is this, um, oh, where do you put it? Put it on the boot? Okay. Oh, I should turn my back to the audience <laughs> while I'm doing this. It's very performative. Okay. All right, let's give shit. <laughs> what? Yeah, sure, let's dim the lights a little bit. And let's please welcome Sharon Daniel. To the All right, thank you. Um, hopefully, I have enough light to to read. I do. Okay. Um, thanks uh, to uh, Greg for the wonderful introduction. And you can confuse me with Shannon any day you want to because I really admire her work. And uh, I also want to thank her for inviting me to be part of this. Um, so our panel was given the opportunity to, to read Ed's paper and encyclopedia article to use as a point of departure for our thinking about this question, when is computing aesthetic? And I'm going to try to be as good as Jim was about doing the assignment, so I hope we can move up to that. Um, in the article, Ed refers to a spectrum of inter- and transdisciplinary research ranging from art and or aesthetics serving primarily scientific ends to computer science serving primarily artistic and or aesthetic ends. And while I agree that a more symmetrical relation might be fruitful, as I just said, I have to admit that as an artist who has taken up technology, my answer to the question, when is computing aesthetic, 
lands a lot closer to the end of the spectrum where the research outcomes of computer science are put into the service of primarily artistic, aesthetic, and for me, political ends. In thinking of the relationship of computing to aesthetics, I've been among those who use the term database aesthetics, uh, coined by Victoria Vesna. To talk about how computing might be aesthetic, one has to have a working definition of what one means by aesthetics. Um, so in the uh, previous iteration of this wonderful encyclopedia, the definition was um, a critical reflection on art, culture, and nature. And for me, it's through this critical reflection that aesthetics and ethics intersect. And it is at this intersection that the question, how should we live, is posed. Querying methodology, how, desire, should, identity and community, we, and the conditions of existence, live. This critical reflection often ends in the question that troubles many artists, and also some of the ones on the panel this morning, what is the political efficacy of art? Now, we generally reduce politics to the struggle for and maintenance of power as localized in the state. Art is usually confined to the realm of the cultural and absented in the space of power and law. I would like to set aside these limited conceptions of politics and art and explore French philosopher Jacques Rancière's premise that art and politics each consist in the effects of equality that they stage. For Rancière, what defines politics is a particular kind of speech situation when those who are excluded from the political order or included in only a subordinate way stand up and speak for themselves. This describes rather accurately, I think, the goal of my work and my definition of database aesthetics. Now, Ed's encyclopedia article discusses a conception of aesthetic computing in which art, artists, and aesthetics have the ability to fundamentally alter the presuppositions of science and therefore the goals of aesthetic computing and the scientific conventions of our time. I have been more interested in using the capacity of computing, particularly the affordances of the database, to fundamentally alter the presuppositions of documentary arts and film production, and fundamentally question the aesthetic, and thus ethical and political, conventions of non-fictional representation. Now, when I talk about my own work, I, and I, I feel like I've said this about 100,000 times, um, I always point out that I see myself as a context provider as opposed to a content provider. My goal is to provide contexts in which those who are in excluded from the political order or included in only a subordinate way can speak for themselves. I have committed my time to the development of interactive and database-driven documentaries, which I'm going to show you something in a minute. This is just a placeholder while I talk. Um, but that's the interface for one of them. Um, I have committed my time to the development of these interactive and database-driven documentaries, which I hope have the potential to materialize a space of dissensus, not merely critique or protest, but a confrontation of the status quo with what it does not admit, what is invisible, inaudible, and othered. Since I began volunteering at a needle exchange and engaging homeless injection drug users, in a process of self-documentation in the year 2000, my work has focused on documenting and theorizing social, economic, and environmental injustice with an emphasis on criminal justice and punishment, the criminalization of poverty and difference, the effects of racism and colonization, and the phenomenon of mass incarceration in the United States. All of these works examine various aspects of criminal and social injustice through first-hand testimony and evidence given by impacted individuals. They are dialogic or co-created works, and because I believe that to speak both from primary experience as an individual with a particular perspective, um, and also as part of a class of shared experience, constitutes a political act. And it's my hope that speech acts of this kind, carried into the register of representation, have the power to transform the public sphere. Now, I'm going to say a little bit on my method and show you another slide that won't mean that much to you. Right <coughs> now. 
Um, in computing, the database in particular allows me to document an issue as a larger site of socio-political and economic experience, rather than as a single story or individual narrative. I work to collect a significant amount of direct testimony from a given site, and then I design an interactive structure in a manner that will circumscribe that site as articulated by my interviewees or co-creators. Now, rather than building a single road across that site to get from point A to point B, or the beginning of an argument to its resolution, the database design maps out an extensive territory, say 100 square miles, and the interface sets the viewer down within the boundaries of this territory, allowing her to find her own way, to navigate a difficult terrain, to become immersed in it, and thus to have a transformative experience. The interface and information design constitute a form of argument, as writing does for a scholar, and a user's navigation becomes a parallel to the path of inquiry, um, a, a distillation and translation of the encounter that I have with my participant co-creators. So now, at last, I want to show you, um, oh, this is another picture I should have shown you before. Um, I want to show you a short demonstration of how this method is applied. Oops. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to pause it. Um, I want to show you a short demonstration of how this method is applied in Public Secrets, a project produced in 2007, which provides an interactive interface to an audio archive of hundreds of statements made by 24 incarcerated women. Their statements unmasked the secret injustices of the war on drugs, the criminal justice system, and the prison industrial complex. Now this is a screen grab with a voiceover narration that describes the data architecture and navigational structure of the project. Public Secrets is a multivocal narrative that links individual testimony and public evidence, social theory, and personal statements in an effort to engage the public in a critical dialogue about crime and punishment, challenging the assumption that imprisonment provides a solution to social problems. The project, authored by Sharon Daniel and designed by Eric Lawyer, was an official honoree in the 2007 Webby Awards. Over 600 recorded statements of female prisoners incarcerated in California are displayed algorithmically, not as archive or narrative, but in constantly shifting constellations organized by topic, theory, and speaker. I think part of me knew that I was, because I had slammed with the girl on the yard who had AIDS, who had kept it a secret. And consequently, she died like six months after we tested. Yeah. Six months after I the piece is organized around three aporia, irresolvable internal contradictions surrounding the prison industrial complex that place the statements of the incarcerated women in dialogue with the writings of theorists including Angela Davis and Giorgio Agamben. Hmm. Addiction and that cycle of abuse. And, you know, once you see, it, and it takes a minute, I think. Users are able to view a transcript for each statement, explore a complete set of statements from one speaker, or pursue topical and thematic connections to new groups of content. I don't want to be here. I have no business here. You know, I said and it makes it very Instead of imagery, the interface is constructed out of quotes from the women themselves, whose statements testify to their struggles in a way that disrupts conventional documentary practice, while creating a sonic texture whose complex interweaving underpins Daniel's abolitionist argument. In this, as in all of my interactive documentary projects, the data and interface are framed by what I think of as anecdotal theory. Um, this theory combines narratives drawn from my encounter in the interviews, annotated research, and analysis. The passages of anecdotal theory, which can be found in the introductions and conclusions, as well as dispersed throughout the works, create a point of entry that allows the audience to become immersed in the subjective plurality that is manifest in the site. Taken together, the recorded interviews or conversations, the information and interaction design, and theoretical framework are an attempt to materialize the Ransarian political, creating a space of dissensus both for participants and for viewers, one that introduces new subjects into the field of perception. Now, a more recent work, Inside the Distance, completed in 2013, 
is an interactive installation and web documentary about victim offender mediation in Belgium, where restorative justice is institutionalized within the criminal justice system. Inside the Distance advocates for mediation as an alternative to dominant modes and theories of retributive justice and punishment. In mediation, victim and offender face each other across a table. Inside the Distance explores the subject positions of each participant and the many ways in which these subject positions are fluid. The mediation meetings often begin with a verbal reconstruction, an agreement about what happened, who was hurt, and how, and then an attempt to understand why. These conversations are a form of reenactment for inside the distance. I staged these reenactments um, as uh, told to me in interviews with victims, offenders, and mediators. And then I edited the video to sound from the interviews. It's an extensive work that includes over 100 original edited video clips of varying lengths, with audio excerpted from 40 interviews conducted in Belgium during a two-year period. And I bring that up not to convince you of how hard I work, but just to help make my argument about the da database as an aesthetic construction. Um, I was going to show you some video screen grabs from this project. I'm showing you some, uh, some uh, slides now. Um, I'm not sure we have time, so I'm going to start uh, this video and turn the sound way down. The conversation <laughs> takes place across a table. <coughs> Victim and offender gauge the distance over which they face each other. The dimensions are not fixed. A span of time, an expanse of space. Reach, withdrawal, restraint. Crime is a social phenomenon. Conflicts, estrangements, violations at once create distance and proximity. The act, signaled by the kind of high piercing shudder that ushers in the epileptic seizure, is an immeasurable, boundless instant of fear and aphasia. And in the aftermath, as with the seizure, there is a loss of time and space. Only the sign and the destruction it announced remain. In the aftermath, two subjects emerge. There is a victim, there is an offender, and there is the space in between. So this project is divided into three sections, the accounts, the spaces, and the positions. Uh, and in each uh, section, uh, the voices of mediators, victims, and offenders are heard describing uh, their experience of actual mediations. Um, the structure also includes a, um, um, a link between uh, the sections based on the cases that are described. I'm just going to flash through this. Uh, so in this section, for example, the positions, these are victim, offender, and mediator. Heeft het al meer in orde gekomen? Al de and in the spaces, uh, the mediators are given a chance to uh, speak about their theoretical and philosophical positions uh, related to mediation on a number of different topics. Um, so mediation is, in a very literal sense, the object of study in Inside the Distance. But the idea of mediation is also a boundary object for me, a conceptual tool that helps me to grapple with questions of ethics, aesthetics, and political activism. In his Effectivist Manifesto, Brian Holmes writes that activism has to confront real obstacles, but the role of an artwork lies in its potential to increase an understanding of the possibility of change through expression that unleashes affect. For me, when computing is aesthetic, it is a means to this end. Thanks. Thank you. What a beautiful conclusion. It was really good. Thank you. Get the boots. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now to work this. The next speaker is Eric Paulus. Uh,
professor in computer science at UC Berkeley and a uh, member of Citrus and BCM. And now he has a microphone. <laughs> Yes. Good. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shannon and and, uh, and Lauren, for putting this together, and for Greg for uh, being our sort of fearless leader through this session. Um, I um, want to kind of talk about this from a framing. I actually like also. I want to thank uh, Edward Shankin for putting together the way that he uh, describes this aesthetic originally, and it's been brought up already. This idea of the kind of crossroads of computer science, art, and philosophy. And I want to kind of play on that as an opportunity to look for other engagements around aesthetic, other opportunities to have different kind of practitioners at play. And I like this idea also, and, and, and Edward put this up as, as one of the ideas about this, thinking about the dress rehearsal for the future and how some of these kind of approaches let us open up new opportunities to explore the future. So I have this quote up here that I got inspired about recently. Um, and I just think about it for a second. It says, imagine something never done before by a method never before used whose outcome is unforeseen. And at least, you know, I, I, I wear a lot of hats and one of them is certainly as an engineer and as a computer scientist and I, I sort of, this resonates with me and maybe it resonates with many of you in your own practice. And what was surprising is this really came from Alan Capro, the artist that kind of brought us the happenings, that brought us a lot of thinking about new kinds of participation, new kinds of engagement, breaking down barriers of, of our practice itself. Um, and I find that interesting that there's this cross-pollination between the aesthetics of computing and engineering and philosophy and art. And I kind of want to play on that. I, run, I operate this group, the Tactical Hybrid Ecologies group, and I just want to play that out for a second because I'm interested in these tactical notions, this adroit planning and maneuvering to accomplish something often beyond the immediate action. I think this might resonate with people as well. Um, and I borrow from McLuhan in his notion of the hybrid, which has nicely come up with a number of other speakers, but the hybrid of the meeting of two media is a moment of truth and revelation from which new form is born. I'm very interested in, I think, that being part of the really critical aesthetic of where we are culturally. And of course, this ecology is not just the kind of biotic, what you might think, but also all kinds of interactions, um, including each other and with the abiotic. Now, I'm going to tell this through kind of three personal stories, just because I have sort of a little bit uh, more um, relationship to them, and I think it will bring forth what I hope will be some argument that we can debate. Um, this is a photo of me with a lot more hair many years ago. <laughs> um, and this is a project I did um, for my dissertation work with John Candy. It was designing these telepresence robots that you could control remotely. I don't really want to go into the details of it, but I want to sort of use it to talk about this um, idea of well, you know, something that I did as a technological kind of um, accomplishment. It actually got me a PhD, believe it or not. So designing these things, playing around, but also exploring them from a lot of different aspects of you know, can you convey truth? How do you have a kind of physical embodiment? Lots of things around nonverbal cues, philosophical is is issues of kind of telepistemology. Um, but it also, um, many of you probably know, there's now many of these. So I didn't generate this slide, someone mailed this to me, but we're way up on the top as sort of starting this kind of movement that now you see a lot of these that exist. And I thought, well, this was great. This was one project that seemed to have worked out. I have many that failed. I'm happy to tell you those offline. <laughs> um, and even the work, this was some pictures from my dissertation, and this is sort of some product material from Double Robotics. It's like, yeah, we'll use it in a factory. Yeah, we thought of that. We'll use it to hang out. Here we are on Telegraph, get our tarot cards read. We <laughs> even thought maybe you might have this thing called a tablet to kind of interact with it. But I thought about, wow, wait, how did I come up with this idea? Where did this come from? And I thought it really came from artists. And in fact, one of them was just thinking about Andy Warhol. There's not much technology in this piece, but it's really inspirational. If you've experienced it, if you go to Pittsburgh, you can actually go and experience this yourself. Um, but also maybe a little more recent Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz, who really looked at this hole in space and the idea of connecting places. And I thought that was very interesting. Let me move on to another project. Several years later, I joined Intel Research. I was part of a, uh, a corporate research lab here in Berkeley. Got a lot of flexibility. I ran a group called Urban Atmospheres, largely to go out and kind of deconstruct urban spaces and look for opportunities for technology to emerge. 
worked with a large group of collaborators, did a wealth of projects with all kinds of different materials and forms, uh, phones, park benches, trash cans, and so forth. I just want to touch on one of them to try to make this point. So one of them was this idea of familiar strangers. These are people that are uh, strangers to you, but they're familiar. It's the guy you always see walking down the street with the dog. It's a woman who's always on the bus with the red blanket. These are familiar people. It's a real relationship. It's a relationship in which you mutually agree to ignore each other without any implications of hostility. Okay? You just can't know all the people. If you ignore your friend, it's actually, you're pissed off at them probably, right? So we looked at this, um, and again, I don't want to go into the whole project, but um, at some point we developed some mobile apps. You can tell by the phone technology. This was some time ago. Um, and it was ways to visualize familiar strangers around you using Bluetooth beaconing and sort of are these people you've seen at a coffee shop uh, or other ways to think about it. Um, it went on to actually influence products that you use. So Dennis Crawley, uh, who went on into Dodgeball and later Foursquare, used this as inspiration. And again, I thought, well, where did this project come from? This was one that seemed to have worked out. And of course, it came a little bit from Stanley Milgram. Same Stanley Milgram did the obedience to authority experiments. He also did a, pro a project called Familiar Strangers. This is from his study. He went to a train platform in the Bronx, took photos, tried to kind of get an idea of if you recognize people. We repeated the experiments. Um, we we're curious if you even could recognize people now. Most people are looking down at their phones, so it's unclear if you recognize people. But again, we also were interested in artists. Vito Conchi, following piece. You can perform this if you want. Find a stranger in public and follow them until they go into a private place. I will not bail you out of jail if you do this, but good luck. And you know, the list goes on. So if we call, and clearly the idea of, the, of obsession and our almost uh, just uh, curiosity of uh, uh, just the people around us. Third project. When I first joined Intel, I was interested in still this idea of telepresence, but how you could convey information remotely um, and have some kind of other cues. And I was really into these nonverbal cues. And I went out, these are pictures from that original study. I was at a farmer's market taking pictures and seeing how do people communicate without using words. I was trying to just observe what happens, how they touch each other, gesture, gaze, cues, things like that. We had a bunch of technology at the time, these small kind of uh, wireless moats that let you sort of look at um, how to distribute networks and do sensor networking. And we thought, well, maybe that could form some kind of a body-worn object that could sense things and communicate them across a distance. And again, apologies, these are from the original slide deck from 2002, so that's why there's Intel branding, but the idea was that, and I also look really weird, that you would tap on this device and it would sort of send some information um, over the internet and, uh, and your sort of partner that you're paired with would feel some kind of vibration. Similarly, you could rub on it and it would heat up and the other person would feel a warming effect. And finally, you could hold it with a two-finger grasp and it would actually transmit your pulse across a distance. So, similar, right? Uh, I'm not getting any money from this. I do want to point out that when I did that project, I was told very explicitly that this was a horrible idea and it should never be done. Please stop this project. So let that be a lesson to all of you, especially students, when you're told to stop doing something, actually often you're on the right track. But again, this got really, the idea was it was sort of an incomplete messaging system. And I really believed in it. But again, I thought this was really inspired by people like John Baldessari who says <clears throat> the best way to make art is to intrigue and to be a bit seductive. You just say, here's this and this, you figure it out. And I thought there's something poetic about that, that we don't have to complete the narrative all the time. And often in my field, it has to be sort of computer science, like we have to complete everything, it all has to work, it has to all function and be really clear. And it got me thinking about other people in this same area. And one of them was a colleague uh, that I knew, Michael Neymark, who did this project called Aspen Movie Map. Uh, many years ago, this was awesome. It's a laser video disc, and you could actually navigate through the streets of Aspen, Colorado. Um, you could look around. It was just amazing, and I thought, man, this is so familiar to me. I don't know why I'm thinking about something that's common. Now, I'm not saying if Michael hadn't done that, we wouldn't have uh, the sort of Google Street View, but Michael did it as an artist, and in fact, he did it using some funding from the National Science Foundation, and he received an award for that. He got a Golden Fleece Award. So this is an award, for those of you who don't know, that's the most egregious waste of taxpayer dollars. So someone stood up on Congress and said, stop doing this at all costs. Please stop. Never, ever do this. It's the stupidest idea. Please, don't waste our money. 
and then we have something else. And it just, the, the setup's the same, you know, just car model year. Michael sent me some pictures of his setup. Um, but it got me thinking about this role of where we're missing opportunities as the, bringing in the aesthetic of artists, bringing in the aesthetics of the kind of milieu of the day of computation. Um, and there, I, I kind of have a list that could go on, on and on. I'll just show a couple more to kind of give you a flavor. Myron Kruger did Video Place, which is very much a full body gesturing system, very similar to Microsoft Connect or Sony iToy. Um, Jeffrey Shaw did Legible City, kind of a bike interaction, very much like a lot of fitness equipment uh, that you see. Um, graffiti, uh, graffiti writer, street writer by the Institute for Applied Autonomy could go out. It was a very kind of activist project about messaging and robotic kind of uh, intervention. And then you could also, Nike decided this would be something at the Tour de France in 2009. Um, our own Ken Goldberg, who did uh, the Telegarden. <laughs> You know, we kind of have Farmville now. Uh, Telegarden let you go in and nurture a garden remotely. Um, actually, there are real devices now for nurturing real gardens. They're just all about marijuana kind of production. <laughs> I'm going to skip a couple of these in the interest of time. Um, I do want to mention that the, I've done a lot of work with survival research labs, and a lot of this is kind of performance and a very visceral experience. They have these shockwave cannons that get the audience very engaged, and we see Disney research using the same technology to create kind of interactive experience. But also this one, Twitter. The idea that Twitter really came out of an art project. It was part of TextMob, which was an activist project to coordinate people that were rallying at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. And in fact, the people that started it went over and sort of started Twitter as basically the same kind of uh, process. So the point I'm trying to make from an aesthetic standpoint is that it is this kind of hybrid discipline. It, it kind of resists definition. And, and, and um, that's kind of come up, and Edward even uh, Shankin mentions it. Even when you look at classical works, you know, homage to New York uh, with Sean Tangley, he's working with Billy Kluver, who was basically a scientist at Bell Labs. And I'm really interested in these works from C.P. Snow. He talks about this intersection, which I think is a point of aesthetics that we could sort of pivot off of in some sense. This clashing of two subjects, of two disciplines, of two cultures, of two galaxies that ought to produce creative chances, right? So for me, some my sort of two worlds at the time, I was getting my <coughs> PhD here. I was in a, a robotics lab. But I also spent a lot of time at survival research labs. So this is a kind of performance group that does large scale uh, sort of machine performances. Um, it was a lot about creating different kinds of controls, different kinds of experiences. And it was not about product. It wasn't about creating a sort of a functional sort of system or something that was even um, optimized. It was about creating a very different kind of aesthetic. Now, I know, you can watch it on and on, but then I run out of time, so sorry. Um, I, w I also want to bring up this individual, who many of you may or may not know, but in my field, uh, he's a very important uh, character. This is Mark Weiser, who was well, uh, basically at Xerox Park, and he postulated, he was a scientist there, he ran uh, part of Xerox Park, and he said, in the future, we're going to have three kinds of computing. We're going to have things called pads, tabs, and boards. Okay, so here's our, we have our tabs, here they are right here, we have our pads, our boards are a little bit in progress, but he nailed the way we would interact with computing in like the early 90s. He also coined the term ubiquitous computing, which for all practical purposes is Internet of Things now. It's the idea that computing will be everywhere. And the thing is, he's a scientist, he's recognized as a visionary in sort of computer science, and he gave a keynote talk, and I found his old slide deck from 1994. He unfortunately died of cancer in 99. And he says, here's how you do these things. He says, start from arts and humanities. Remember, he's coming from Xerox Park. This was the sort of very innovative. They, they're the people that brought us you know, the laser printing and ethernet and lots of technology that we use every day. He's saying, all these other things need to be part of the conversation. And for me, I draw um, kind of this notion of how art communicates across this chasm in some sense. And I like this quote from John Dewey. He says, art throws off the covers that hide the expressiveness of experienced things. It quickens us from the slackness of routine and enables us to forget ourselves by finding ourselves in the delight of experiencing the world about us in its very form, our very qualities and forms. And I think often we, we miss that. We're so focused on functionality and completeness that we forget this poetry. Um, and in fact, one of the things is, I, I also we work in design, and these are words that often get kind of used with design. And 
we also, I've been engaging in these ideas of kind of critical design, and the, and the sort of terms on the right are more about critical design, more problem making or problem framing, more things that will kind of design for debate. I think this is the a kind of way for computer scientists and engineers to start to operationalize and think about things in another space. And it goes by lots of different terms. You may have encountered it in any one of these different terms, um, which you can debate nuances, but for the sake of discussion, they're kind of together. What is critical design? It's, it's this process of making things that don't actually, you're not making things as a product, you're making things to create kind of discussion or debate. In some sense, if you think about the world now and the present, and we say this is everything that's possible, um, a smaller might be the plausible things, and even smaller than that are what is probably going to happen. And what critical design is, it creates this landscape for us to do things in this preferable space. And I'll end with one critical design piece as sort of a discussion point, as Greg alluded to this materiality. We looked at this materiality of energy, um, and the idea is if you actually harness small bits of energy. So this happens to be my son many years ago. And imagine I sort of collected some energy from him and he went out and he brought it home to me. And that night, uh, you know, he read a book basically from that light. And the question is, is that somehow different than plugging into the wall? Um, and I would say, yeah, it's, it's handmade. It's, it's something that's a gift. It's from a loved one. But we don't think about energy as having those kind of properties. We think of it as we just plug in. But it very much harkens this Benjamin kind of notion of the aura and the authenticity of things. And we sort of played with ideas of how energy could be parasitic. And we designed these kind of objects that were intentionally handcrafted um, to actually harvest and collect energy in public places, literally to steal it off of other public spaces. So you could attach it to buses or trams. You could put it in public fountains. You could put it on top of... Uh, uh, escalators, uh, you could put it on someone's headlight. And the idea was to kind of expose where energy opportunities are, to steal it, to charge your phone with it. What would it mean to sort of make a phone call using the energy from the handrail at the, you know, Walgreens or something, or at the bar station? And I'll just um, end by coming back to McLuhan. And I like this idea of how he thinks of kind of the role of artists. He says, only the artist has the power to discern the current environment created by the latest technology. Artists show us how to ride with the punch instead of taking it on the chin. And I really like that kind of notion of how we can kind of go together. And this is an aesthetic that I'm basically interested in. So thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to ask all the panelists to take a seat here. I'm going to sit on the side so I can see you all. Um, make yourselves comfortable. There is still a microphone on you. Um, yeah, I guess you can share this microphone. But this doesn't mean you get to say more than anything. Greg, this is Greg. Can you sit on the other side of the table by chance? I'll over there. Either way, just, yeah, because otherwise I can't hear everybody. Oh, for the video? Okay, yeah. I have to move because of media. Media. There. Okay. All right, Great. so um, I'm going to um, ask one question and try and uh, synthesize a little bit what was said here. And uh, uh, just start with this notion that uh, aesthetics seems in this panel to have a lot to do with perception, leading to some kind of wonderment, and wonderment leading to some kind of uh, construction of a structure that ultimately leads to empowerment. And it's both uh, uh, emotional in that we start with a, an experience, a feeling, a phenomenon that we perceive and that we then later on want others to perceive and we build tools and aesthetics in order to convey that sense of empowerment that we saw and pass that on to others. And um, so, so quotes along those lines is, well, well, Eric's last slide was a bunch of little devices collecting energy and there's a sense of wonderment there. there like, it's like a toys acting out in some way or uh, populating the world with them, their desire to collect energy. It's a beautiful slide. It's a lot of wonderment there. Sharon Daniel spoke about unleashing affect and um, that being the fundamental mission of art and uh, and then finally uh, Ed uh, spoke a lot about aesthetics having the power of making things right, making things good but for me that leads to the question do aesthetics always produce good results and um, are we always inventing a positive bright future or um, in fact are, are we are we sometimes uh, overloading aesthetics with this positive quality and uh, should we ask ourselves when do when do aesthetics uh, mislead us 
So that's my question to you guys first. So can aesthetics also mislead us and give us a false sense of maybe awareness, a false sense of comfort, a false sense of access to database, a false sense of knowing what we're doing, um, or a false sense of joy? Okay. So I think Marx in 14th Vermeer, he talks about how any particular aesthetic manifestation or formal style can be appropriated for any political agenda. So it's not as though a, a particular aesthetic approach implicitly has some goodness in a universal sense attached to it. It could be used for whatever political purpose. So I think, <clears throat> I mean, you see this, for example, in the use of aesthetics for Nazi propaganda. I mean, it worked wonderfully well. Um, and that was a good thing for the Nazis. It was a bad thing for a lot of other people. So aesthetics in and of itself is no better or worse than technology at providing something good or evil. It's more you get these certain assemblages of human aesthetic objects that um, can float in different ways and perform different functions. Okay. Uh, anybody agree or disagree with that? Um, well, I think it's, uh, it really depends, again, on what your definition of, of the aesthetic is. I mean, if you're talking about theories of beauty, which is one definition of aesthetics, it's kind of an outdated definition, um, then, no, I don't think there's anything inherently good about any particular theory of beauty. Um, in fact, there might be something really negative and yeah. subversive about that. Um, but I, that's why I really liked the definition from the earlier uh, encyclopedia, because it contained that notion of critical reflection, and it talks about culture and nature, and critical reflection is not necessarily always positive, but I think it's always productive. So that's what I would say about Yeah. Well, I already have my... Uh, oh, you have yeah, your mic. Well, um, <laughs> I think any sufficiently interesting technology has some kind of a dark side. It has some kind of um, almost an aesthetic that isn't certainly going uh, purported towards beauty. I know we're going way beyond that as a kind of parochial definition of, of aesthetic. But I, I would say, that, uh, coming back to some of the things at least that I was trying to mention around critical design, that these are things that make us think, and they might actually postulate back to kind of Edward's like original notion of paving the future, we might want to question our progress. So they're positioning these objects and experiences as things that might question how we really want to live or be in the future. And we often engage in a concept, I do this in my classes all the time, called design noir, where I actually tell the class, I say for one class you can actually design things that actually do those things we don't often talk about. They, they're wasteful. They, they help you be, you know, uh, manipulative or things like that. So, so just a follow-up question then. Uh, the, on the concept of critical reflection, do you think that some of these objects actually, even though they're just computational devices to some extent, produce critical reflection? Can we, is there a case where a computation as such can support critical reflection? I mean, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on uh, SOLAC, these esoteric programming languages, yeah. but I think that that's one example where the instrumental of computation is really contested for often for artistic purposes but also as a game as a joke as opening up as I said this sort of space of play for questioning other possibilities so I think that um, there are ways in which computing can be fundamentally aesthetic but also fundamentally computational oh uh, okay uh, all right Go ahead. Um, we don't all have to answer Yeah, that. I know. It's totally, I mean, it's cer certainly computation, I think the way I view it is if we stay focused on sort of only designing things that have sort of function and they help us you know, optimize our lives or create a sort of improved human experiences, these are excellent things to do. I don't want to deny that. But we're missing out on a broader conversation about just designs and aesthetics that we're not talking about. We're too focused on the things that essentially the economy is telling us we should be sort of moving towards. So in, in some sense, that's at least certainly a role of the academy to try to question uh, the direction. And the computational side, 
there has to be sufficient knowledge of how the computation actually functions because to kind of corrupt it or to play with it, like any artist, you have to understand your material, you have to understand your medium. And so uh, when you, there's some knowledge of how the actual computation works or the coding or whatever it is, and then once you kind of understand that, you can kind of manipulate it, and that's when it becomes interesting. That's when I think we respond to particular works that as sort of powerful, or essentially make us think or change perspective. They operate yeah. as computation, but as kind of art or critical design. There's a tremendous role for the artist to open up reflection for others. That's a beautiful process sometimes. A powerful process sometimes, yes? So I would just say I'm not a technological positivist at all, and I think that computation is not necessarily unlike other kinds of um, efforts at communication. So it's, it's a language. It's, um, and languages are things that help us interrogate um, ideas and phenomena and our experience. So without being positivist, I think I would answer your question sort of like Ed did. You know, it, it's an opening. It opens things up. But it's not, I don't really think it should be privileged in any way as a thing that opens things up. It's just another language. Okay. So um, we're going to go to questions from you all, and uh, hopefully we have actually plenty of time for a beautiful discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. But I just wanted to see if you guys had any questions for each other um, before we go there. Maybe not, maybe yes. Because you just saw each other's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I, I, I have a question for myself and Eric. <laughs> That's very aesthetic. I like and, that. um, That's aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting how we both pointed to examples of the manifestation of what might be called aesthetic technological development in a prior period of history, and how it became capitalized as a um, form of technoculture, and why we think those are good examples. Um, maybe we should be looking for other sorts of examples to justify the value of aesthetic computing or something like it um, that don't have these um, sort of capitalization mm -hmm. events um, in commercial markets. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your mind is supposed to answer your own. Uh, no, no, that, that, that's actually oh, an excellent. Well, that's thanks for asking the question. I have to try that more often. No, that's an excellent critique because it, I think partially the reason why I presented those, and maybe this, it's because this is not exactly the audience, but often I'm left, uh, people are questioning why, you know, why should I care about these things that seem of no value? They are, they are, they are. It's art, I will dismiss it, and they, they sort of don't see how it connects in with culture. So those examples are explicitly supposed to kind of almost knock you on the side of the face and go, oh my goodness, those are things I do. I didn't realize that there's an artistic kind of history of that, and there was an entire you know, precedent. So this audience, I think, is kind of beyond that and thinking, well, why is it so, like you're asking, why is it so tied to a kind of capitalist or some kind of economic, you know, and we certainly should question other directions. So I think you, that's a good critique to rethink uh, the way we should present examples, because those examples themselves um, outline the landscape of what we talk about as this computational aesthetic. So uh, yeah, it's a good, well taken point. I had another question for myself. <laughs> and this comes back to something that you just said, Sharon, how artists and art practice are just one of many ways of getting at interesting critical questions that should not be privileged. And I mean in my talk and my thinking and stuff I've done, and I'm also critical of this, this idea that the artist has some sort of extraordinary special insight that is somehow going to save the world or come up with the next big thing in the economy or whatever you know the outcome of that evolution is. And um, on the one hand, I'm really critical of that, but what is it? What do artists have to offer? Do they have something special and unique to offer that other people who do other things don't? Well, first I think that's not exactly what I was saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, though I would agree with that point because I think that artists are among um, other people 
um, more or less equal in terms of the ability to do interesting things in the world. Um, so I don't think it's a privileged position, and very often it's an underprivileged position. But uh, what I was saying was that I don't, um, I don't think technology and and the computational should necessarily be privileged as um, as a sort of uh, mode of inquiry or a tool for questioning or as a language for discourse. Um, so I'm, you know, not for that kind of teleology about the future and that technology is the answer to the future and that it's necessarily going to provide some sort of, you know, uh, utopia. And uh, so that's what I was saying, okay. actually. Um, just now I forgot what you were asking. <laughs> no, you, were answered, asking you answered the, the question first and then okay. went back to correct my misunderstanding. <laughs> okay. Eric, do you have anything on that? You know, the audience is fine. All right, well, I, I will say just briefly that to answer your question, that as, as, as artists, I think we have the opportunity to reflect uh, collective awareness to the collective. We, we, we maybe, and, and, and we take the courage, the emotional courage to do that, and oftentimes we fail, but sometimes we succeed. And so we can reflect to others their collective state, and uh, um, that's a powerful thing, and, and there's a deep desire for it. To, to have that experience, to not be alone, and uh, to and it's an emotional transaction, uh, and so so the question here is when this emotional transaction gets supported by a technical um, device, and does it get amplified in a proper way, or does it get somehow subverted by the technical device? And uh, I guess I guess it, is it happens from case to case. Okay, let's go to audience questions. Um, I'm going to start right here with you. Hi, I just uh, thank you, Paul. I was just interested um, to think about what uh, the way that things get framed in this afternoon session in relation to the morning session and the kind of questions. So my first thought was really thinking about, I was wondering about the unequal power dynamic between art and new technology, um, literally economic um, access, and then also the romantic ideal, uh, sort of idealization of the, of the arts. So as soon as it has the disempowerment in some ways, the economic like minority, it has this reifies status in terms of being able to talk about this other um, magical ability to transform or change. And I'm just curious about that. Does that make any sense? Um, uh, so, you know, so thinking about, you know, how, how does fine art not become, or other technologies, for example, um, rape fine art in order to kind of borrow and, and kind of commodify is one question. And then, um, you know, just in terms of that, sort of back to those questions that came up in the morning about, you know, what, what gets evaluated and, and the good of that, I think, would be really great to bring those back into the afternoon session. I, that makes sense. I don't know that statements rather than questions. <coughs> okay, now let's, let's give you guys the chance to answer that and then go to Michael. It seems like uh, a question you okay, could answer. Sure. Um, no, a great question. I, I do want to come back to this idea that, but first I want to do the back part of that, the evaluation <laughs> side, yeah. because often, again, and this is I'm using the lens that I, I use often to look at the world, and sometimes that is, we evaluate things in terms of if they're usable or how functional they are. And sometimes that rhetoric creeps into art or art practice and becomes very kind of problematic. I've seen it happen where people in my own discipline start to go, oh, you're an artist, we can help you make this function better. Like, that's not what artists do. That's not the kind of questions they're interested in. So there's problems with this intersection of these disciplines as well. I think one other thing is, are they, you're, you're trying to ask, um, are they the, the sort of transformative properties or this issue of where are the divisions and when is it sort of fine art, when is it new media art, when is it something else? That's fuzzier for me. I mean, I see, what I do see is in certain disciplines there are specific conversations going on, say that in, in painting or in sculpture where um, it's very hard to read directly into what the conversation is as an outsider because there's some specific debate going on. And that is something that's harder to pick up on. But certainly there are things that are cultural kind of commonalities about us as people or uh, sort of the kind of humanist side of things that I think a lot of the work can touch across um, universally. And the other viewpoint from the technology side is that it it is very much, I mean, artists always play with the kind of cultural elements of the time. And certainly technology is something that is, again, kind of new what we have. 
And so that's something people are trying to critique and play with. And I view that as one of many elements that, that artists could use or operationalize, not all the time. Um, and this issue of accessibility is becoming really interesting because the barrier has dropped for a lot of these things. I mean, the work that we saw earlier, especially the stuff that uh, Ed was showing, where it was, you know, you have to have lots of computers and no one had access to these kind of robotic systems. But now we have all of these uh, really inexpensive kinds of tools. People are much more familiar with working with them. There's, you know, you're well familiar with these kind of open source, do it yourself. And there's this whole amateur movement. And I, I just want to say something about that amateur issue because sometimes there's a pushback about, I don't want to get involved with that. I'm a professional. I do what I do because I'm a professional. Which I say, the root of amateur is really a moderate, to love something. So people that are amateurs really should love what they do. And that's kind of where it historically comes from. So I'm interested in kind of bringing back the power of the amateur, the kind of rise of the expert mm -hmm. amateur. Maybe we've seen, I mean, artists have certainly worked in that era. I mean, you know, art <coughs> era, you know, there's that like bringing kind of everyday objects. And I think that there's a lot of cross-pollination that could happen. So sorry, maybe didn't answer the question, but I, I said a lot of things that maybe were provocative, so that will feed something. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, maybe I could also respond to some aspects of your question regarding um, what works. Get can you all hear me, or do you need me for a recording, or what? Just project. Real just project. Loud. I can just project. That's fine. Um, what works get shown? What are the value of structures? What are the support structures? I need this. So, um, I mean, there are many different art worlds. Right. I was thinking about the rape, of, the rape of, of fine art in the commercialization and to, into commodification. You gave examples where you say, look, here's an artist, here's a stolen thing from an artist, here's an artist, here's a stolen thing from an artist. Uh, that was basically okay. what I saw that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to talk about that in terms of power dynamics. And that was really. Sorry. sorry. Right. Okay. That's not, that's not the. Okay. Sorry. Maybe yeah. I misunderstood yeah. your question, too. Right? Yeah. It wasn't been doing that a lot. Well, with that issue, because it comes back a little bit. But those people asked that question before, like, what? Why is that? Like, why didn't they commercialize it, or why did? What happened? What was? But I think artists they have a very different agenda of what they see as. This is back to your kind of evaluation of the goals. What What do they see as an outcome as something that's when the piece is done and when they're moving on and when they feed and for, you know, sometimes in, in sort of my field, it's like, oh, you you get like a second round funding or something, right? These are kind of weird, contrived kind of exit strategies. But for, for artists, they often move on, and then later people come and sort of commodify these things. Um, some of them that I've talked to are, they're actually not bothered by that because they're more interested in a deeper question that they're seeing in their artistic pursuit. And in fact, if they went and just were commercial about it, that would very much adulterate their kind of practice. I think that that's changing somewhat. I think that emerging generations of artists are very eager to commercialize the creative inventions they come up with, particularly artists who are working with emerging technologies and computational devices and things like that. Um, you also have organizations like Creative Capital that are not only funding artists, but are also trying to transform them into good neoliberal subjects by creating uh, their own support structures that uh, sort of capitulate to a market economy. So I see that also as problematic. Um, but at the same time, how are, artists going, how are artists going to support themselves if you can't sell your work unless it's painting, essentially? Or if you can't get funding for your work from, I don't know, an organization like Blade of Grass that funds participatory art practice and socially engaged art practices? Um, so yeah, these are really difficult questions. But I think that a lot of artists are actually eager to sell their stuff. Mm -hmm. See what they're doing as potentially valuable intellectual property. We're going to go to the next question, if that's OK with you. And that's Julia. Thank you so much to everyone for your interesting comments. So Eric, um, I want to build on something that you showed and then ask a question to the whole panel, which is I was intrigued by the slide from the early 90s from the Xerox Park person whose name I can't remember, um, and you highlighted something about how our computing has to come be based in these um, core, these other disciplines, and there was philosophy, you pulled out, you highlighted arts and humanities. 
which I really appreciated. But the phrase that he included that for me really stood out was feminist criticism. And I was wondering if the panel might speak a little bit to the state of feminism and to its ongoing urgency given the kind of fulminating online sexism and the tremendous mm -hmm. gender imbalance of a lot of these technologies. Uh, me? I don't know. Uh, okay, so, okay, I already have my, yeah, no, I, uh, no, that's a great point. I, I should have highlighted the whole thing, quite honestly, is mainly because I, I don't want people too much in a wash. I want the takeaway to be really arts and humanities, but thank you for pulling out, because there were some other really strong nuggets in there uh, that are really critical. Um, so, clearly, there's this, there is a huge problem of gender imbalance or the way that there are kind of role models that are formed. Um, we just happen to have this uh, kind of feminism, uh, kind of Wikipedia hackathon that went on here at Berkeley um, last week that Berkeley Center for New Media was part of, um, and Anna and Jill, and but this this idea of it's for it's it, historically that has come out as a kind of it has a male dominated sort of rhetoric, uh, terminology, um, role models. And it doesn't reflect the kind of participation that we would imagine or desire from society at large. And so what I see is the projects that, that interest me in that intersection are ones that utilize pieces of technology but really um, upset that kind of power structure. They basically invert it in ways that are, that are significant. And I think because the technology is kind of so ubiquitous, you don't see it coming until all of a sudden there's that twist in, in the kind of art or the kind of, uh, kind of experience and suddenly you have this change in the way that um, the roles are inverted or there's a new opportunity, um, there's a new voice given. I, a lot of the work that at least I do even sort of just on the research side, it's very much about I would say kind of empowerment and giving a new lens to the world. So be it, you know, you can debate little bits of technology or what it does exactly, but Conceptually, it's giving people a new way of viewing the world and having a voice in it and a new and sort of engagements with communities. And that's something I think can span lots of things, not just even in gender, but lots of other kinds of uh, inequities that are across you know, our society. Again, sorry if that wasn't an a, a good answer, but I, mean, that I do feel strongly about that. It's really um, not spoken about enough in our, in our field. So I, I think that kind of gender inequality um, and male-dominated culture is particularly problematic. In, in digital media, our practice, I think there are two kinds of ends of a spectrum. Um, that one in which technological innovation is the most privileged uh, kind of practice. And I think that part of digital media, our practice, is dominated by a sort of uh, you know, a sort of masculinist kind of uh, set of, of criteria and motivations. I think that comes out of the failure of our educational system. Um, I, I mean, I, I had math anxiety growing up. I mean, I think it goes so far back historically that women are in every way, you know, acculturated to not be technologically um, interested and engaged, right? Um, oddly, a lot of digital media artists that are very successful are women, and they're mostly women who have reinvented themselves from some other uh, kind of um, position within their art practice uh, because they've seen something, uh, some sort of affordance that technology could give to a goal that's not about technolo technological innovation as such, but about something else, which is basically what I think Eric was alluding to. Um, artists are generally researchers, really. Think of many, many, many artists think like researchers. They're not necessarily interested in, in the kind of work you have to do to push out an innovation into a product, right? Because they do have these other concerns. But there are a lot of arts practitioners in the field of digital media art practice that wouldn't even think, you know, I had to push myself to think about the question of computational aesthetics. I told Michael Kelly earlier I probably would have been more comfortable on this morning's panel because I'm much more interested in those questions of participation than I am in, in questions that have to do 
with technologies as such and with computation as a kind of language or platform, software studies, a kind, those kinds of interests are not really my concern. And I think those discourses are very male dominated. Um, and I think, again, it comes from the failure of the public education system to, uh, to bring women into particular kinds of ways of thinking. Or maybe it's just not interesting to women, and women have a lot more interesting things to think about than that. <laughs> just to follow up, when I was writing Art and Electronic Media, which has literally hundreds of artists working with electronic new media in it, uh, it was very hard to find women working with electronic media in the 50s, 60s, a little better in the 70s, a little better in the 80s, people like Lynn Hirschman start working, um, much better in the 90s, until in the 2000s, you know, so yeah, the 2000s, there were about one-third women I was able to include and, and feel really like this was solid. So I think that the presence of women in the field of artists working with electronic new media, computational sex, is growing. But I agree, with Sharon, with your uh, identification of different areas of the field where the really computational part is really male-dominated. Um, and that is a problem. But that's a, it's a cultural problem. It's part of the educational problem. It's, you know, after the Sputnik education, the U.S. focused on, you know, STEM stuff, science, technology, engineering, math. And we're back to that, despite efforts to include arts in STEM to STEAM. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just not really happening. And the cultures of engineering programs. I mean, I teach a class. Uh, sorry, I teach a class that's an elective for uh, people in the computer game design program at Santa Cruz, which is a really successful program. And it's you know, like uh, you know, there are a lot of guys in it. I was about to say something that might be too pejorative. I really like those students. I find them really interesting. I also find them really challenging. But um, I see that cross-section of a larger program that I don't know the statistics, but my guess would be it's, it's you know, 90% male students in that program. So that's a larger, you know, cultural issue. But again, I would say, well, there are a lot of really interesting women doing a lot of really interesting things. It doesn't have to be computational and it doesn't have to be technological in order to be productive, to be empowering, and so But I do think there should be more women of notability on Wikipedia. <laughs> I will also answer that question as I walk towards Michael, and I think these are really important points, and I think uh, technology implies automation, automation uh, implies the question whether we can call it back if it doesn't work. And if you say this is a gender imbalance and I want to call it back, well oftentimes you can't because it's too, too large and it's a black box and we can't read the algorithm anymore. So the algorithm may be unfair, but can we stop it? Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Kelly. Actually, I want to pick up uh, Sharon on your last comment uh, to connect this panel with the previous one and ask about the uh, participatory dimension of the study of computing or computational computing more generally. I mean, obviously, there's interactivity in computing, and that's something like participation, but there is a difference. Um, and a lot of participatory art takes advantage of new media, new technologies, and so on, because it helps to. Um, facilitate participation and so on. But this also seems to be a, um, a, a split, or move, they seem to be moving in different directions. I mean, Eric, were you emphasizing the sense in which when computing becomes useless and more artistic, and so it's not simply <coughs> a, a next thing that the economy wants of you or something, whereas participatory art uh, frames itself often, not always, but as useful art. So one is going more toward the useful and the other more toward the useless. And participation is what actually combines those two in an interesting way. Great question. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think also the, the definition of usefulness is kind of complicated there because this, this kind of uselessness of artistic computational aesthetics is is premised on useful things are products and that's the neoliberal um, way of thinking but um, I think the usefulness of participatory art which was very interestingly discussed this morning about what could that mean 
is also an open question. Um, you know, usefulness from my perspective has to do with empowerment, as uh, Greg mentioned at the beginning of the questions. It also has to do with uh, like uh, engagement across social and economic boundaries. Um, it has to do with learning, um, and I, I think that. Um, you know, the project that, that Greg described when he was introducing me was a kind of what I thought of as a participatory media project. Um, you know, hacking uh, commercial tools, giving them away to people, having them um, author and self-document, having them organize that material through a custom-built uh, you know, interface and a database and allowing them to generate folksonomic kinds of uh, structures around their own material and then use that material in their own kind of representational and performative acts out to other publics and that engaged other publics. To me, that was a form of, of usefulness because it had to do with this crossing of boundaries and, and borders, particularly uh, around uh, questions of, of race, around uh, questions of class, and also ethnicity, nationality, and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's... <laughs> um, thank you for calling attention to the overlap between these two panels in these two areas of artistic practice that might not be two areas, um, because there is so much overlap. But I hope that my talk demonstrated some significant overlaps. Um, indeed, work in literature, participatory art, socially engaged art practices, is really informative for me for thinking about the sort of art that I write about and teach about. Um, because there is so much overlap, and Sharon's work is a perfect example of that. So, I mean, I think that this is a really wonderful context and opportunity for these two discourses to have a dialogue with each other. And it's wonderful to bring up that dialogue, because I think we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, and uh, I think that these different um, the way that art practices get siloed is, you know, it's important to make sense of things by ordering them, otherwise everything's a muddle. But it also does violence to things by separating them in ways that um, really uh, interfere with our ability to understand a whole and the interrelationships between things. So, um, yeah, I would like to expand that dialogue, and maybe I need to publish in your new journal, Grant. You need to publish in Grant's journal, and you need to publish in Leonardo. And you know, we, uh, there was an exhibition at SF MoMA that Rudolf Friedling organized on participation that really tried to cut across these kind of siloed areas of practice to demonstrate continuities between them. Continuities that you don't see, for example, in Claire Bishop's book, Participation, mm -hmm. which is really a very exclusive kind of um, uh, literature on participation that excludes, for example, Frank Popper's really important 1974 book, Art, Action, and Participation. So, I mean, there's a, a, an interesting history to these practices and the way that they're uh, <clears throat> uh, formalized within discourses, I think, is a point of that needs more critical investigation. I just want to actually like push back on the terminology a little bit because for me it's more when I look at a lot of computational systems or even critiquing my own field. There's an over kind of just too much of a, too much of a focus on productivity and efficiency. I mean, how do we get to Bard on time? Can I get kind of cool hip songs downloaded? Can I you know, <coughs> find a cool hip bar when I'm out of town? Can I get the Uber ride? I want those things, of course I want those things, That's like, that helps, but we're missing an entire conversation about where are the technologies that help us be curious and wonder about our world and be more reflective and sort of ask bigger questions. And it's that I just feel that that's not part of the conversation, so it's not so much a useful versus usefulness, it's more too much about helping us be more productive and efficient, and there's this missed opportunity about that. I think that the participation thing, I mean, in terms of our many most of our technology doesn't operate in solo. It's, I mean, it's, it, things have to be have a connectedness, and that's um, something that is kind of a celebratory moment because there's this whole idea that we can reach out to others in lots of interesting ways. And so I think that brings up a natural dialogue about where are the new models of participation, um, and where can we learn from the kind of participatory art practices and social practices that we've seen um, really successful. I was interested in going back to the second part of Dee's question and thinking about doing this connectivity between the two conversations. 
um, and, and also getting us to think about what public means in these two different arenas. And, and so I think that question about evaluation and, and value, what, what is a value, is a really interesting question. Of course, in digital media stuff, you always get that question, and you always get it from someone who's an engineer, and that person wants you to have a specific set of criteria for success uh, from an engineering perspective. And you know, and then as an artist, you never have that, and you kind of go, uh, like that. But I, I think that what it means in both uh, digital media art practice, especially if it's a you know, a public-facing kind of uh, public engagement kind of practice, um, and in participatory um, social practice art, is is this notion of what an artist can do because of the way in which the artist is coded within culture to not have to answer questions like that, right? Or to not have to answer them in that particular way. You know, the artist can can say. I don't have a set of criteria from sociology that I have to meet or I have to come to some conclusion, but it allows you to be in a space where then you can be part of a public, and, and that's, not the, that's not exactly what I meant to say, but I think there's something about publicness that, that we haven't talked about here today that's part of both of these arenas that could be really interesting. Well, maybe we need a unit for, make that or on, one or on describes the value of art. I don't know. Um, the, there is one more question. I'd like to give it to the person who really feels that they're frustrated that their question didn't get uh, asked, and uh, it's really important, and we have to do it right now. Who has that urge? <laughs> There's two there. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the first, the first speaker spoke about how computation might be, or software can be an instrument to expand the mind. And I'm concerned about places where um, digital technology actually is shrinking the intellect. Um, from all the places from our inability to find something without Google Map to the kinds of responsibility around non-material economy of what it does to our sort of social environment. And the third speaker spoke about critical design as looking at that preferable swatch. And I guess I'm wondering what, how, how is critical design really looking at these, like the sort of absence of haptic experience, the decreasing of the poetics of experience by our constant attachment to devices that many of which are rather useless or can be useful, but have useless applications. Maybe you can feel the critical design aspect of the question. Um, I mean, I, mean, I'm, I share your um, unease with uh, the limits of technological devices for expanding the mind and the potential for them to actually shrink it. Um, and one of the criticisms that sort of came towards the end of my talk was from Jack Burnham's notion that uh, an overly rationalistic society is one that's going to just sort of self-destruct. So, um, I mean, that's also another kind of response to the other question about, you know, the instrumentalization of things and the non-instrumentalization of things and, and the role that artists could play in kind of expanding uh, the way that we think about computation and the devices we use so that they serve other functions, that they maybe reconnect with, this goes back to the first panel, this, sort of, this disconnection from nature and these sorts of things. And, um, yeah, so I'll just pass it on to the critical design aspect of the question. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. yeah, so I think uh, well, one thing is we can't sort of, we can't just be Luddites and say, all right, we're just going to disengage, we're going to just, I mean, this is the culture we live in. But that said, that doesn't mean that we should be extremely proactive in uh, generating what that landscape should be like. So this discussion around critical design is largely to populate out a set of experiences and interactive kind of objects, we'll say, that start a conversation away from what I kind of view as this kind of near-term kind of discussion of things that are very um, sort of just incremental from what we have. I mean, great, so if we have this watch and then maybe we'll have a different kind of watch, I mean, we need to break out of that. So critical design at least 
does that, and it tries to also approach it as questioning what is being left behind that's important. Is it some human experience? Is it some tactile experience? Is it something about nostalgia? Is there something, I mean, these ideas have even just, you know, we just take pictures now, we just have them, it's lost that kind of importance of the kind of preciousness. So can we bring back, I mean, even the energy project, like is there something that can have this poetics or something that brings a, a sort of emotional experience of something that we, we don't have anymore. It's not going to make sense to just try to keep everything the same, but I think as kind of practitioners, be we sort of artists or engineers or, you know, other, you know, designers, we should start to embody a conversation away from that local minima and so that we can at least see some other landscapes. I always say some of those objects that get designed, they intentionally feel honestly a little ridiculous sometimes and things that people go why are you building this this is no one wants this but I know we don't want that but I want to go over there and I want to be at that point and look from that landscape and see other designs that we're missing out on um, but I think there is a big point about making sure that we find the things that we are kind of missing bringing some of those back into the fold because that's what makes us humans. That's the kind of poetry that's missing from a lot of the technologies and things that we have today. And that's where I really lean on artists to play a really significant role in this sort of um, the, the humanist in this kind of um, dialogue. If, if I could just go back to something that um, uh, Lauren said in your introduction. One person's politics is another person's capitulation. No, it's Shannon. Oh, Shannon. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. 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 Which, sorry, Shannon. <laughs> And I think that that's really key and in, in implicit in your question. Because artists who are working with these technological objects are arguably capitulating to the whole technological ethos. At the same time, there is something that I think artists can do using these technologies in a metacritical way to reflect critically on those objects and their, their social uses. So, again, one person's politics is another one's capitulation. Can I, can I just say something really quickly? I feel that that's... That type of issue is not, is when we're thinking about transdisciplinary aesthetics, which is an organization that's supporting the conference, I feel like those types of issues of where one discipline meets an aesthetic discipline. Mm -hmm. And there, that there's, to me, I almost see it as a, a sort of a different axis, that you can have different um, levels of specialization that push an aesthetic conversation forward, different different types of collaboration that put push a technological conversation forward and then some that maybe do both. And I think maybe we maybe need to be careful of forcing some projects that don't aspire to do both to force them to be that, but to sort of know where they are in the in the in the uh, on the axis, you know. Anyway. Sure. Sharon, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, on, on, on the, the, the last question. Um, Oh, I didn't need to take the last question. <laughs> well, I thought about the question in terms of, um, I, I mean, I, I see the point of the question. I think what I like most is when people hack technologies. Mm -hmm. If their work is about um, technology as such, as opposed to the use of technology for mm -hmm. some other end, um, I, I think it's productive to allow for the creative repurposing of uh, technologies as a mode of um, sort of trying to undo uh, the neoliberal project, right? So um, there are artists who are innovators, but there are a lot of artists and people who don't identify as artists who are really engaged in, in activities that could all be kind of called hacking, like I'm going to redo this, I'm going to undo it, I'm going to critically reflect on it through taking it apart. We were having a conversation at Santa Cruz the other day, someone asked a question about uh, is something computational, and, and I think I said, I don't care um, whether something is computational. I don't think of digital media, our practice is necessarily computational, but more about the, the process and the way, mode of thought that has to do with taking things apart and questioning them and reflecting on them critically. And you can do that with a lot of different types of tools. You can build your own tools to do it, and you can take someone else's toolkit apart. Do it. All right, I think we're up on our break, so shall we transition? Let's give our panelists a round of applause for taking this
and the three o'clock the uh, conversation continues. So thank you for coming back. <laughs>